from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. And here is Gary Groth to speak about Fantagraphics and the graphic novel. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, well, thank you very much for coming. Um, as, uh, as George has said, this, uh, we're celebrating, we happen to be celebrating our uh, 40th anniversary this year, which is a little terrifying. <laughs> Um, we have a, we have a um, celebratory tome coming out, uh, it'll be out in November, and uh, we just uh, sent it to the printer. It's a 700-page oral history of the company with about 200, 250 participants, uh, artists, writers, journalists, critics, and various observers. One of the people who contributed to the, um, to the oral history mentioned in a, in a letter accompanying his, his interview that Fantagraphics has traversed half the entire history of the comic book, of the American comic book, which I probably knew but didn't quite register, and um, which kind of shocked me when it did register because comic books were started around 1933, 1935. And Fantagraphics started in 1976, so we have, in fact, been around for half the entire history of comic books. Um, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I want to do today is to give you a history. Uh, they asked for a history of fanographics. I thought that might be a little too self-serving, so I wanted to make it, because we've been around for the history of what essentially is um, the growth of comics as a mature art form and as, as the graphic novel, I wanted to give you a history of fanographics and the history of comics in the last 40 years. Um, starting with um, my history, which was um, as a comic book fan, I was I grew up here in the Washington D.C. area. As a matter of fact, I grew up in uh, both Virginia and Maryland, both sides of D.C. And when I was growing up in the 1960s, I was an obsessive comic book reader. These are the kinds of comics I read, mostly Marvel and D.C. comics. Um, read them assiduously. And uh, by the time I was 13 years old in 1967, I started publishing a fan magazine about, um, about comic books. And this is the cover to the second issue of the fanzine. As you can see, I stole the logo from the Fantastic Four. <laughs> I uh, put this together in my bedroom. I would basically uh, put sheets of paper into a typewriter, type on it, um, it was full of articles. It was actually full. Of, I actually had interviews with uh, cartoonists, uh, artists of the time who worked for Marvel in DC, people like um, Sal Buscema and John Romita. I would send them questions in the mail uh, to, through Marvel in DC, and then they would they would actually write back. I would actually send them questions um, on pieces of paper and leave them room for answers, and they would <laughs> dutifully fill out the answers. Uh, this is when there were a lot of comic books being published at that time, and there was what was called comics fandom, which I was very much a part of at that age. And this was a loose-knit group of fans that, that, that lived th all throughout the country. And we would go to comic book conventions, which was an incredibly exciting thing to do at the time. Um, I'm sorry this isn't bigger. This is a uh, photograph of the uh, banquet held at the 1969 New York Comic Art Convention in New York City, Statler Hilton Hotel. And this was a banquet celebrating Hal Foster, the artist who did Prince Valiant. The arrow is pointing toward Hal Foster. Uh, he was interviewed by an artist named Gil Kane, who is sitting right next to him. And this is a great snapshot of the comic book industry in 1969. This room is filled with comic book professionals. Um, Al Williamson, uh, if you know Al Williamson, is seated right there. Um, John Buscema, I mean, just many, many people who worked in the comic book industry and the comic strip industry at the time were there, including a lot of fans who became professionals later on and including me. <laughs> uh, I happened to be uh, in the front row because the table I was sitting at was off to the right and was out of camera view, so they put the, table, the uh, chairs in the front. Anyway, this, this, you know, something like this was an incredibly exciting uh, thing. 
That's a picture of me um, in my office, AKA the spare bedroom in my parents' house, um, hard at work on one of my fanzines. Um, you can see, let me see, that's, a, that's what's called a typewriter in front of me. <laughs> and to the left of me is a uh, tape recorder. I think that's a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, which is what I would tape interviews on. This is when I was, of course, a little bit older. I was probably about 16 or so. And I would actually go to New York. When I went to New York, I would bring this gigantic, now this gigantic, you know, 15-pound tape recorder and tape interviews with professionals. Um, eventually, as I, as I got older, this is uh, probably, the, the, I, I published these two magazines. That, the, the magazines got better. The fanzines got better. I got a, a little bit better at designing them. Um, I got a little more sophisticated in terms of design and editorial content. Uh, I went from, from Xeroxing them in my father's office to actually having them printed offset. <coughs> and um, this would have been around 1972. <coughs> Now, somewhat simultaneously with, with this, um, was a, what, I, what I consider to be the first comics revolution, which was the uh, underground comics movement and um, amateur magazines published by professionals. This is a copy of Wit's End, which was a magazine published by Wallace Wood, who was a professional at that time, started off uh, EC Comics, and he was working for DC, Marvel, and many other publishers at this time. In 1965, he started publishing a magazine called Wit's End out of frustration at the restricted editorial edicts of the companies he worked for. He hated doing what he was doing. He, hated, he notoriously hated editors. He hated being told what to do, and he hated the content of comics. So he started his own magazine, which he invited his fellow professionals in, and which he edited himself. In 1964, in 1960, I think 1966, uh, Frank Stack started publishing The Adventures of Jesus, and Jack Jackson started publishing God Knows. These were the very, very beginning of underground comics, which would flourish a few years later. These two artists happened to be from Texas. They would eventually migrate to San Francisco. New York City was uh, the epicenter of underground comics in 1966. These are two images by Robert Crumb. Uh, the East Village Other ran uh, comics and would eventually um, run a uh, comic supplement, which the underground cartoonists in New York would contribute to. Um, there were a lot of underground cartoonists located in New York at that time, Kim Deitch, Spain Rodriguez, Trina Robbins, and many others. Now, underground comics, I think, represented um, a liberation from everything that had gone before in comic books. The content in comics were always uh, aimed at, targeted at children. Uh, underground comics uh, were the first time in the history of comics when you had autonomous cartoonists who wanted to tell stories, own their own work, retain their rights, and consider themselves as artists and not as either craftsmen or employees, or people who were just doing what they were told. These were people, um, these were artists who were interested in self-expression, comics as self-expression. And to me, uh, I, I noticed underground comics a little late, because I was a little too young to, to have, to have um, experienced them early on. But so I got into underground comics when uh, I was like leaving high school in 1972. I was probably 17 or 18. And they were a revelation to me. They were just unlike anything I'd ever seen before. They were clearly anarchic. They were clearly artists doing exactly what they wanted to do, um, as opposed to following uh, the dictum of, um, of editors of publishing companies. So in 19, um, I, went, I went to college. I had a, a long and, and, and ultimately failed college career. I was restless, and so my I, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. I studied um, journalism at the University of Maryland. And ostensibly, I did want to become a journalist. Um, but I guess I also had, um, well, first of all, I wasn't sure if I was, I was actually employable. And I resented working for other people. And I did have a kind of entrepreneurial sense about me. So my partner and I decided that we wanted to start a publishing company. My partner at the time, Mike Katrin, who was also studying journalism at the University of Maryland, uh, 
So we decided if we wanted to start a, start a publishing company, we needed money. And I had put on comic book conventions in the Washington, D.C. area, so I knew how to do that. So the thing we thought we could do is put on a rock and roll convention. <coughs> this would generate vast sums of money, and we would start a publishing company. <laughs> so 1975, we started it in 1974. I would have been uh, 19. And so we, start, we, we, we started with this idea of putting on the equivalent of a comic book convention, but we thought since more people like rock and roll than like comics, this was a sure bet. So we actually rented the Shoreham Americana Hotel, which I think is the, the Americana Omni Hotel now, it's still here, which was a gigantic hotel. Um, and we started promoting this convention throughout the Washington, D.C. area. We literally worked 20 hours a day for something like nine months. Uh, we got, we secured speakers for the convention, including Hunter Thompson. We got rock bands to play. We had a room of memorabilia and collectibles, just like they do at comic book conventions. We had rock critics from Rolling Stone attending the convention. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go back to this. Um, the convention was a complete bomb. We put everything we had into it. I dropped out of college in my, after my third year of, um, of college. I was studying journalism, as I said. We both dropped out to do nothing but work on this. Um, and it looked, it looked like it was going to be a success. I mean, we had radio stations promoting it. We, did, we really did an amazing job. And it's like nobody came. Um, I mean, people came, but far too few people came. And we lost everything that we had. In fact, we lost more than we had. We made negative money. I spent the next year gainfully employed, just paying people back what they owed us. But in the meantime, a friend of mine offered to finance, because we were, I was so interested in putting out, in actually publishing. And I, had a, I had a space in my apartment that was set aside for uh, paste-ups, layouts, typewriter. Um, a friend of mine decided that one, one way we could make use of the, of the failed rock and roll convention was to use the mailing list and start a rock and roll fanzine. Well, we were interested in rock, and ro rock, in rock and roll that much, but we were interested in publishing, so this was a way of publishing. So we, pu we started publishing a, kind of a collectible magazine called Sounds Fine here in Washington. So we actually had a setup where we could put together a magazine. We used a local printer to print it. And this was 1975, 1976, and these were the kind of comics being published. Now, in 76, comics had really hit some sort of nadir. Um, you can go through the history of comics, and there's usually something good being published. Uh, in the 1950s, you had EC Comics, you had John Stanley's Little Lulu, you had Carl Barks's <coughs> Donald Duck, uh, you had Harvey Kurtzman working, you had Bernie Krigstein doing interesting work. Well, this was a period where there was almost nothing good being done in the mainstream comics. <laughs> I mean, it was just complete crap. And I didn't quite realize that at the time because I had really kind of stopped reading comics. But in 1976, I'm sorry, um, this is uh, in 1974, there, there, were, there were, underground comics were still being published, but they were on their last legs. Um, in 1974, a guy by the name of Mike Friedrich started Star Reach, was, which was a kind of intermediate magazine, which was somewhere between underground comics and mainstream comics. You would get mainstream comics artists to do exactly what they want, which was by and large what they were doing for mainstream comics, except with some more sex and violence. Uh, in 1976, Harvey Picar started publishing American Splendor, inspired by the undergrounds. 1978, two in, the first two um, regularly published independent comics were started by Richard and Rundy Peeney with ElfQuest and Dave Sim with Cerebus. 1978, uh, a publisher by the name of Eclipse started publishing graphic novels. Um, their technique at the time was to take artists from mainstream comics and offer them a better contract, creative freedom, and let them do exactly what they wanted. These are two examples. One was a detective story and one was a kind of post-apocalyptic um, action thriller. And in 1976, Mike Catron and I took over some, uh, a collector's magazine called the Nostalgia Journal. This, was, this had been published for 26 issues. They were struggling to make it. They were being published out of Texas. Um, we decided, 
that we could inject new life into the into the magazine, change the direction of the magazine from nostalgia in general, which was about uh, movies and serials and music and so forth from the 40s and 50s, and change the focus into comic books, which is what we knew about, which we cared about. Now, I have a copy of Arcade, which was a magazine edited by Art Spiegelman and Bill Griffith. And I consider this to be something like the last gasp of underground comics. Underground comics will still continue to be published, but this was the last issue of Arcade. Uh, it lasted six issues. It was an ambitious magazine uh, edited by Spiegelman and Griffith, uh, published by Print Mint um, in, um, in the Bay Area. And uh, they, they were striving to get newsstand distribution because the head shop network that sustained underground comics were collapsing. This was an experiment that failed, um, although it was, a, it was an excellent magazine that tried to tra both transcend undergrounds and embody undergrounds. And we published the first issue of our Nostalgia Journal literally within a month of the last issue of Arcade. One of the intents of the, of the magazine is we wanted to finally impose critical standards and journalistic standards on the content of comics and on the comic book industry. Uh, I, was, uh, I was in high dudgeon about this because I realized at that point that the history of comic books was the history of exploiting creative talent. Um, almost all of comics were done on a work for hire basis, which means that the, the company owned uh, all of the work that the, the, uh, the artist did. Uh, the artist got a pay to page rate, owned nothing, never had a pension, and um, And it struck me that if we were going to, if the, if the medium was going to advance, that we had to use a model from the underground comics, which is that the creator owns his own work, generates his own work, and is the autonomous creator of that work. And that's what we started to do. Um, this is an example. We interviewed uh, Will Eisner, who created The Spirit in um, 1940, I think. And so what we do is we started turning our pages over to artists who we admired and respected and who we thought were doing the best work in comics. At the time, we started giving them a voice. And this is a good example of the kind of feature we would run. Um, you can see where Will Eisner said, I believe that sequential art is the oldest communicating art form. It has served humanity since early man because it has the ability to trans transmit a story. I'd like to be joined by other artists in an effort to produce literature and comic art. For, for us, at this time, this was probably around 1977, 78, this sort of thing was like a rallying cry. Um, you know, the history of fanzines were the kind of fanzines that I published, which were just gosh wow fanzines. We, were just, you know, we just loved everything coming out of comic books. We, we worshiped the artists who did them. And so for the first time, we had a sustained magazine whose intent and mission was to try to propel comics into a greater sphere of art. And something like this, for example, was inspiring. Uh, we would interview artists who we thought uh, were um, mavericks in the forum, who pushed against um, the editorial strictures of comics, people like Wally Wood, artists like Gil Kane. Um, Gil Kane was one of the most eloquent critics, uh, not only of the medium, but of the industry he worked in. We would give artists a voice who were having disputes with, uh, with the companies, which is the first time that ever happened. And we were vociferous about this. We, would, we were criticizing um, the main companies, Marvel and DC, month in and month out. Uh, an issue did not go by when we did not run uh, a pretty brutal critique of what was going on, the status quo of the business. Uh, we would review the, um, the work itself, um, which could be incredibly harsh. Um, when someone like Steve Gerber or someone like Frank Bruner had to dispute with a company, we would give them an opportunity to talk about it. There was, um, previously in the comic book industry, there was this code of silence where people, I mean, people just simply didn't talk about it. Um, uh, artists who had been in the industry for a long time were very reticent. Um, 
and the new generation, and he, the, the only artist who, who broke that mold was Gil Kane, but the new generation of, of artists <laughs> were willing to talk about uh, what they considered to be the um, depredations of the comics industry. So we would simultaneously run journalism, um, such as uh, a report on, um, on what, an attempt to start the, a comics guild, uh, which, was a, um, which was a meeting in Neil Adams' studio in 19, I think it was 1978. And virtually every comic book artist working in the field was in that room. It was a gigantic studio, and it must have had 50 or 60 artists in it. Um, everybody from editors to artists like Steve Ditko attended this meeting. Neil Adams organized it. And of course, uh, you know, previously there had never been that level of an attempt to actually start a union or a guild. So that was in the atmosphere. Uh, we would, for example, um, I would debate Frank Miller as to whether Batman was, was fascistic. I mean, these, these were important issues of the day. Uh, we would interview what we thought were progressive cartoonists like Art Spiegelman, who was uh, um, editing Raw along with uh, Francoise Mouly. So we were, trying to, we were trying to interview the best artists we could find at that time while simultaneously attacking the status quo. Um, this was a little later, but one of the, um, one of the campaigns I am most proud of is uh, when uh, Marvel Comics refused to return Jack Kirby's art. This is a prime example of what we were doing at the time. Uh, Marvel started returning artwork to creators, which they had held uh, up till then. Um, but they refused to return Jack Kirby's art unless he signed a very long and extensive retroactive work for hire contract, which he refused to sign. And um, so we literally started a campaign to force Marvel, to uh, um, embarrass Marvel into returning his art. We um, collected signature, signatures from professionals. We sent out uh, petitions to comic book retail stores. We uh, ran many, many news stories about it. We interviewed people about it. We interviewed Jack about it. Um, ultimately, he got his art back. Um, he, was, uh, he ultimately was willing to sign a short one-page form. Now the magazine, the, the, the magazine, it's hard to describe because the times have changed so much, but the magazine was so divisive that the industry was really polarized between those in the industry who loved the magazine, loved what we were doing, enjoyed our mission statement, and those who absolutely despised the magazine and just wished it would go away. And those, uh, involved, and those were essentially the companies themselves um, and a lot of people who worked for the companies. So in 1979, uh, we ran an interview with a science fiction author by the name of Harlan Ellison. And based upon this quote, the comic book writer he was talking about sued us for $2 million. Now this was in 70, uh, we ran the interview in 79, I think he sued us in 1980. Um, I think 19, uh, later that year I ran an editorial where I talked about um, uh, a publisher who published a competing magazine with a comics journal who sold it. And I uh, accused him of um, you know, a career of hustling as a monument to selfish opportunism and spiritual squalor. Well, <laughs> shortly after that appeared, he also sued me for $2 million. <laughs> and then not long after that, um, unbowed, we published uh, a long review of a comic that an artist by the name of Rich Buckler did for Archie Comics, where he basically plagiarized Jack Kirby, panel for panel. So we ran a big two-page spread with a 48-point uh, 48 headline uh, announcing that he plagiarized Jack Kirby. And um, he also sued us for almost a half a million dollars. So in 1981, by 1981, we were fighting three lawsuits for a total of about four hundred, four and a half million dollars. And we didn't have a pot to piss in. I mean, we were operating out of a large house. There were probably about five or six of us working there. We worked there and we lived there. We were all in our 20s. Um, I was probably about 26. And I knew nothing about lawyers. I knew nothing about lawsuits. I had never been sued. Now you might think this would be 
terrifying, and it was, but it was also exhilarating because it meant we were having an effect. It meant that we were having an impact on this industry, that we were making waves, that people were paying attention to us. Um, this, was one, this, this was so incredibly divisive in the industry that it's hard to, um, it's hard to describe. Um, there was actually a, con a comic convention, the same convention I went to in 1969, uh, and this occurred around 1982 or three, where I caught, I was at the convention, I caught wind that Michael Fleischer, who was suing us for two million, uh, actually secured a room at the convention, in the convention hall, to get artists um, on his side to do sketches so that he could sell the sketches and contribute all that money to his lawyer to help sue us. So when I, just, when I discovered that, I flipped out and asked the convention organizer, Phil Suling, if I could get space to have artists of my own to do sketches. I mean, I just felt we needed to have some sort of parody there. So he, so he reluctantly agreed. And that night I called around and uh, the artists I got were um, Art Spiegelman, Bern Hogarth, Mike Kaluta, uh, and Gil Kane. And so we sat in this smallish room, smaller than this room, maybe about half the size of this room. We were on one side, and they were on the other side. <laughs> and I wasn't too interested in raising money. I just wanted to be there as a presence. And we stayed there for a few hours until the convention organizer walked in there. And, and it, was, it, it was just horrible. I mean, people walked in the room, and there was just like this horrible, poisonous atmosphere in the room. <laughs> you know, just, just two sides glowering at each other. And the organizer finally came in, and he said, you all have to leave. You're ruining my convention. <laughs> it's just like, it's like th this space was just so poisonous and horrible, that, which I was happy to do. So we all, we all filtered out. But that's how divisive it was within the industry. I mean, uh, you know, the people who were suing us had their supporters. They were being egged on. He said, you know, you've got to put these guys out of business. Uh, <clears throat> the Fleischer lawsuit took seven years and about $200,000 to win. And we did finally win it in 1987. Um, and we were so happy, we were so celebratory that we won, that we featured it in an issue of the magazine. This was a cover of the magazine. That is a drawing, um, this is a drawing by uh, Don Simpson. Uh, the main character is Jim Shooter, who was the editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics, uh, who was, in fact, organizing um, artists to work against, to, you know, to do, to do things against us, like that, uh, that signing. Uh, he testified against us during the trial. Um, and in the issue, we actually published um, transcripts of depositions and um, trials, uh, uh, depositions and uh, transcripts in the witness stand. Um, the other two lawsuits, by the way, we also won, um, although they were much easier. Now in the 1980s, so we were publishing this magazine, this very, very contentious magazine about comics. We were on the one hand championing work that we thought was good, but there was so little work being done in the, in, in the 70s and early 80s that it was, very, it was hard to find work. Uh, there were a handful of underground comics <laughs> being published. There was Harvey Pekar, um, but very little. So in 1981, we fell into com publishing comic books. Uh, this was the first comic we published. It's a graphic novel by Jack Jackson called Los Tejanos, <coughs> The History of the Mexican-American War. I got to know Jack as I got to know so many artists by interviewing him in the Comics Journal. Um, um, uh, our underground comics columnist, we actually had an underground comic, uh, column in, in, the, in the magazine, which we ran every issue, and there was approximately one underground comic coming out per month uh, at least, so we could, we could write about underground comics. Uh, he interviewed Jack. I got to know him. And um, he just asked me if I'd be interested in publishing uh, this graphic novel he was working on. And we had the distribution infrastructure. We were being distributed to comic book stores. The comic journal was being distributed in comic book stores. And I thought, why not? We can just add this to our, to our infrastructure. We can just put it in the pipeline. So in 1981, we published a graphic novel, Los Tejanos. And in 1982, we published what I consider our flagship Magazine, Love and Rockets, uh, the Hernandez Brothers. Um, again, we were publishing a, you know, a critical magazine, a magazine to review comics. So the Hernandez Brothers self-published their own Love and Rockets. They went to whatever the equivalent of a Kinko's was at the time. 
Uh, they published a 32-issue comic called Love and Rockets, and they sent it to the Comics Journal for review. And I opened the envelope and I read it, and I was so astonished at how good it was. It was just such a breath of fresh air. It was different from Underground Comics. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen in comics before. It had a naturalistic interpretation of life. Uh, it had sex, but it wasn't about sex. So I wrote a glowing review of it for the Comics Journal. And I think it was sometime after I wrote the review, um, and, and the, uh, Gilbert and Jaime would contribute spot illustrations to the magazine. So I was somewhat aware of them. I don't know if I really corresponded with them or not, but at some point I got a hold of them. And it was just a spur of the moment thought, but I asked them if they'd be interested in us publishing this as a regular magazine. I mean, they seemed young, they seemed like they could you know, turn out work, they were excited and enthusiastic, and they said yes. So we started publishing Love and Rockets in 1982. It was my idea to actually make it a 64-page magazine-sized comic, and the reason for that is because I wanted to distinguish it from the regular pamphlet-sized comic books that were being published at the time. I wanted people to know that this was different. Um, hence, 64 pages, which was a lot thicker, a lot meatier, and the magazine size, which back then denoted something I hoped different and more serious. Um, so we published Love and Rockets quarterly uh, with the fifth issue. We turned it, we turned it into a 32-page magazine, which we thought was uh, more prudent financial, uh, uh, in terms of market. And in the early 80s, when we were, we were living in Connecticut, we moved from Maryland to Connecticut uh, because we needed to get closer to New York, which was the epicenter of comic book culture at the time. All the comic publishers were publishing in New York, and because we were publishing a magazine about comics, we needed to be around them, so we moved to Connecticut. So while we were in Connecticut, we started publishing Love and Rockets, and we started publishing other, you know, other books and other magazines. Um, our philosophy was that good cartooning is good cartooning. We didn't really care if it was contemporary. We wanted to preserve great cartooning from the past. So we started publishing collections of Popeye and Prince Valiant. We started publishing a magazine in 1981 by the name of Nemo, which was a magazine devoted to the history and aesthetics of newspaper strips and uh, illustration and gag cartoons. Uh, a historian by the name of Richard Marshall edited it for us. He lived uh, a few miles away from us in Connecticut. So it was a real easy collaboration. He would basically put the magazine together. He would drive down and we would pull a couple of all-nighters and put the whole magazine together um, in our basement. And this is the uh, house we worked out of in Connecticut. It was a gigantic six-bedroom house. Um, one way we survive is by keeping overhead low. And one way to keep overhead low is to live in the place you work in. And so that's what we did. Uh, the entire basement of the house uh, was the office. We started encroaching upon the second floor. Um, we all lived there, we all worked there. And we lived in this place for six years. This was located in Stamford, Connecticut, which is a bedroom community of Manhattan. And where we clearly did not belong because this was an incredibly Ritzy neighborhood. We were surrounded by doctors and lawyers and TV network executives. And the only reason I think that they rented it to us is because the owner never actually met us. The owner lived in Puerto Rico, and I guess this was just a house he owned. Um, and our neighbors, um, you know, it had a very, very long driveway, which we shared with another house. And I think our neighbors never understood what we were all doing there. And uh, the back of that was bordered on a forest, so it was very isolated, which is what we needed. Um, from Connecticut, we moved to Los Angeles, and that's where we started publishing yet more comics. Uh, we started publishing Peter Bagg's Neat Stuff in 1985. We started publishing Jim Woodring's Jim Magazine, I think in 87, and uh, Dan Klaus in 1986. Um, Pete Bagg visited us in Connecticut and brought his portfolio over and originally wanted to edit an anthology that, that he wanted to edit. And I suggested, no, why don't we just do a solo magazine of your own? 
These are all, uh, by the way, uh, both Nisa and Jim are magazine size because we were still trying to push the magazine agenda. We were starting to try to push the distinction between comics and, you know, and what we did. Um, um, I met Jim. Gil Kane introduced me to Jim. Uh, they were both, both working in animation at the time. And Jim showed me these amazing auto journals that he self-published. And of course, you know, I w the first thing I thought is, we should publish this as its own magazine. Um, and Jim put together a, um, a magazine that was, um, you know, that could be more widely distributed. And Dan Klaus just uh, out of the blue sent us a, a proposal called Dan, uh, Lloyd Llewellyn. Dan was living in Chicago at the time. And uh, I thought it was so good that I offered to publish it, and we debuted it as a supplement in an issue of Love and Rockets, which by then had achieved some degree of success. Um, in the 1980s, we continued publishing. You know, I wanted, I wanted to expand, expand what we were doing. I wanted to branch out from, from newspaper strips and from comic books into other forms of cartooning, and these are two good, good examples. Uh, these are both reprints that we published around 1988, uh, Ralph Steadman's America and Jules Pfeiffer's graphic novel Tantrum. It was 1987 when we started publishing Robert Crumb, who had by then, even by then, become a legendary figure in the underground comics. Um, I, met Cr I met Crumb when I called him up to ask him to do a cover for an issue of the Comics Journal with a Harvey Picar interview. And Harvey Kurtzman told me that Crumb was very skittish and that I should mention his name when I called him, otherwise he might hang up on me. And so I did, called him up, and um, kind of battered my way through his defenses. And he opened up a little. He did the cover for Harvey Picar's issue. And then I did a long interview with uh, Crumb himself. Uh, drove up to Summers, I'm sorry, to uh, Winters, California, and uh, hung out with him for a while. And it was during one of those trips at, uh, in Winters in his studio when I, I broached the subject of doing the Complete Crumb comics. And I pitched it that we, could, we would publish everything he ever did from 1964 to present. And he was sort of wary of that idea. But I finally talked him into it. I talked him into sending me tons of his sketchbooks, kind of, uh, a lot of his um, original art, and into doing new covers for the, for the books. We started publishing underground comics. These were in the late 80s as well. Um, Skip Williamson, Skim Also Rises, and uh, Howard Cruz collection. Now, what was happening in the 1980s is, you know, there was mainstream comics, which were really pretty miserable. But 1981, Weirdo and Raw started being published. Art Spiegelman and Francoise Mouly started publishing Raw in New York, and Robert Crumb edited. Uh, weirdo um, in the, on the West Coast, and Last Gas published it. So you had these these two really vital magazines starting. Uh, Kitchen Stink was st uh, still functioning uh, out of Wisconsin. Um, now Kitchen was um, sort of the in the middle of underground publishers. He, he, he didn't publish work quite as um, harsh as Print Mint and Last Gas and Ripoff. Uh, but he was publishing um, underground works as well as reprinting work like The Spirit by Will Eisner. New publishers were starting to come up. Uh, new competitors to Marvel and DC, new basically mid-level publishers who wanted to compete with Marvel and DC on their terms. On the left you have um, uh, Zot. Uh, the right is Miracle Man by Alan Moore. These were published by Eclipse. You had a publisher by the name of First Comics out of Chicago, and this is also in the 80s when comics became decentralized. Tommy started moving away from New York, and you could publish anywhere. Uh, First Comics uh, wanted to compete directly with Marvel and DC with these either superhero or quasi-superhero comics. 1989, Drawn and Quarterly started. Uh, and left is Chester Brown's uh, Yummy Fur, right Julie Doucet's Dirty Plot. Uh, and then in 1997, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, uh, but uh, the next major publisher was Top Shelf in 19, I think, 97. They started publishing. Oh, I'll give you time to read that for a second. So in the 1980s, we sort of established ourselves as an alternative publisher. 
the magazine was monumentally contentious through the 1980s and continuing into the 1990s. Um, what happened in the, in the late 1980s is um, Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were published around 1987 or 8. Uh, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird published these, self-published these. They were black and white comics. They became the first, the first enormously successful uh, comic self-published by anybody. Made uh, Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman millionaires virtually overnight. Uh, and, that's wh and what that started was what was called the black and white boom. Suddenly black and white comics were hot because the Ninja Turtles sold well. Everyone wanted to publish either black and white comics or some ripoff of the Ninja Turtles of which the comic on the right is a prime example. And believe it or not, crap like this would sell. Like you publish the Black Belt Hamsters and it would sell 40, 50,000 copies. So there are a lot of these imitators out there. Um, now, Kevin Eastman, um, imprudently, and Kevin is, Kevin is a very sweet guy, he's a very idealistic guy, but he took his millions and he wanted to start a publishing company. Um, Peter Laird actually started a foundation, uh, the Zurich Foundation, where he would finance self-publishers to publish their own comics. Kevin wanted to start his own publishing company, and I remember talking to him one day, and, and um, it was probably 1990 or so, and, and he said, yeah, I'm going to start a publishing company. I was really inspired by Fanographics. I want to do you know, the kind of comics you're doing. And I thought, Jesus, you know, like this is a guy, with a, this is a millionaire who wants to publish the kind of comics I want to publish. Um, so in 1991, Kevin started Tundra Publishing. And these are two examples of comics he published. Um, he published for a couple of years. And in, I think it was 1990. Three, I'm sorry, 93 or 94, he ran out of money. He literally spent $14 million in two and a half years of comics publishing. It was, it's one of the most amazing stories in the history of publishing. Um, it was just a, a money trough. And so I did a long interview with him after Tundra expired. What happened is Tundra actually melded with Kitchen Sink um, in, I think, 1994. Kitchen more or less took over Tundra. Uh, and then Kitchen actually expired, I think, in 1997. Tundra kind of sunk Kitchen as well. Um, so I did a long interview with, uh, with, with Kevin a couple of years after Tundra went under. And this is like a, you know, an example of how the interview went. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's one of the funniest and most astonishing interviews I ever did because we went through the whole Tundra experience and how he could go through $14 million in two and a half years by publishing alternative comics, which I kind of knew theoretically was possible, but you didn't notice. <laughs> Um, so these are the kind, now, now we published interviews like this in the 90s. We were still publishing very contentious interviews in the 90s. Um, another, another huge factor in the 90s was the beginning of Image Comics, which was a so-called rebellion from uh, Marvel comic artists who fled Marvel, started their own publishing company, uh, and essentially did work that was even worse than their comics at Marvel. <laughs> so I always considered that kind of a bogus revolution. Todd McFarlane was the artist who drew Spider-Man, who was sort of the ringleader for the group, Seven, who started Image Comics, and I did an interview with him, um, where I basically hammered home my point that this was not a genuine revolution in the history of comics, but more of a, you know, opportunistic way to exploit their success um, at Marvel and um, produce comics that are even worse than what they were doing there. We continued to publish the kind of cartoonists that we, we liked, admired, and respected. These are comics that we published in the 1990s. Uh, we started publishing, we started collecting comics. Uh, previous comics that we published in serial form, we started using a technique of publishing that, collecting them into graphic albums, which were eventually going to be called graphic novels. So, for example, we collected Love and Rockets uh, into a series of books. This is the first volume called Music for Mechanics, published around 1990. Um, Ghost World was serialized in Dan Klaus's Eight Ball. We eventually collected that into a graphic novel. Uh, we continued publishing artists 
Peter Cooper, Terry LeBan, and Roger. Um, artists like Roberta Gregory, Renee French. and Chris Ware, and Joe Sacco. Um, now, Palestine is a kind of um, a great success story. When, when, when Joe approached us, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, in, uh, in the early 90s, we had published a couple of things that Joe did in the late 80s. Um, Joe actually started um, working for us as a reporter for the Comics Journal in Los Angeles around 1987. Um, and Joe wanted to be a cartoonist, so we, we did indeed publish a couple of comics that he did in the 80s. In the early 90s, he approached us about doing um, a comic called Palestine. Or is that the late 80s? I'm sorry. Early 90s. Yeah. And he wanted to go over um, to Israel. He wanted to go over and uh, do some um, journalism on the ground and come back and do a, a chronicle of what was going on in Palestine. We naturally thought that was a great idea. So we started publishing Palestine as a comic book. And at that time, we only had distribution in comic book stores, which were completely indifferent to such comics. Uh, we were probably lucky to sell 2,000, 2,500 comics, Palestine. And uh, Joe continued to do it. Um, we continued to publish it. Joe made no money doing it. And because a cartoonist does not make any money selling 2,000 or 3,000 copies of a comic book. Incredibly labor intensive. And uh, I think we published um, 11 issues, something like that. Nine. nine issues. And it was an odd number. So we published nine issues of Palestine over the course of about five years or something like that uh, to a complete and absolute indifference. Um, we tried to do our best to promote, we promoted the hell out of it, we explained to people this was a new kind of comic, this was graphic journalism. Comic book stores and the patrons of comic book stores couldn't care less. It was only later when, you know, such a thing as graphic, graphic novels became known and we were able to publish it um, in, a, in a book when Palestine became one of our best-selling books. But back in the 90s, nobody Nobody knew anything about it. Nobody cared about it. Everybody thought it was peculiar that we would publish a book about you know, a, a journalistic comic book. Um, in the 2000s, we were going through one of our many, many uh, periodic financial crises, which, which has you know, bedeviled the company for, for ages. And in 1997, uh, I finally got around to interviewing Charles Schultz for the Comics Journal. Um, I decided, you know, it was time. I met Charles Schultz in 19, I think, uh, 1987, where I, I um, was a junior partner in an interview with him. So I visited him in his studio, but I'm sure I didn't make that much of an impression on him. Um, so in 1997, I called his office, and I asked him if he would sit down for an interview, and he said yes. I did an enormous amount of preparation and flew down to Santa Rosa and spent a marvelous day with Charles Schultz. And we had a great time. Uh, we did an interview in his studio. Then we walked over to his ice rink where he hung out for another couple of hours and just chatted. And at that time, just casually, and I think spontaneously, I broached the subject of collecting all of Peanuts. And uh, I'm not even sure if I remember if I wanted to do it, but I, but I just mentioned to him that I thought it would be a great idea if Peanuts were collected systematically. Because I thought, because the collections that I had read to research the interview were just all over the place. They were scattered all over the place. Um, they were poorly edited, badly designed. And I said, you know, it'd be great to have, a, to have a, a, a systematic collection, all uniformly designed, of all of your work, all of Peanuts. And he said, well, I don't think anybody would be interested in that. <laughs> and I said, no, no, people would be interested in that. And, um, and then later on, I spoke to him on the phone. And... I brought it up again, and he finally gave me his blessing. He said, go ahead and, you know, try for it. It was a few years later when I actually managed to do this. Um, he unexpectedly died in 2000. Um, not too long after that, I spoke to his widow, Jeannie, and told her that I had broached the subject with uh, Sparky and that he was in favor of it. And she was very much in favor of it. She was very enthusiastic about the idea. So in uh, 2000 and... 
four. We, we came out with the first volume of The Complete Peanuts. And uh, this was our most successful book to date. Um, it came at a great time because we were going through another one of our financial crises because we did not have $14 million to blow through. <laughs> and publishing Peanuts really, you know, was one of the many times we were, we were saved by, um, by coming up with something like this. And we've been publishing Peanuts over the last uh, 10 years. Um, we're publishing the last, uh, I'm sorry, the last 12 years. We, we're publishing the last volume um, this month, uh, not sorry, next month, the 26th volume. We started publishing the, um, the Sundays in full color because the Sundays appeared in black and white in the regular um, complete peanuts. And now what I want to, I, 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 this is sort of our greatest hits, but I want to give you a sense of the scope of what we publish currently and what we've been publishing for the last decade and to give you a sense of how broad we view the art of cartooning and what we're doing to preserve uh, the history of cartooning and to publish contemporary graphic novels. So I broke this down into categories. One thing we do is publish newspaper strips like Crazy Cat, uh, Floyd Gottfriedson's Mickey Mouse, Walt Kelly's Pogo, Crockett Johnson's Barnaby. And as I mentioned, we started publishing newspaper strips in like as early as 1981 with the same philosophical disposition, which is that we were just interested in what represented good cartooning. Um, both of these we published in the 1980s, but we went, at, we back, went back and decided to do it right. The, the printing quality is so much better. We're publishing the Popeye strips in full color, which we couldn't afford to do in the 1980s. Um, we're publishing the best of what we can find from comic books, so we're reprinting all of the EC comics from the 1950s. Um, Uncle Scrooge and uh, Donald Duck by Carl Barks. Uh, collections of work by artists like Bernie Krigstein, Alex Toth, these are both to be from the 1950s. A huge coffee table book collecting all of Will Elder's best work. Um, Bill Malden is a great example of a cartoonist who is not a you know, newspaper strip artist, not a comic book artist, uh, not a narrative artist per se, but a great cartoonist. Um, his Willie and Joe cartoons from World War II have ne had never been collected before. We decided to collect them in a big two volume slipcase set. Uh, Gayon Wilson, another cartoonist who I didn't think had been properly recognized. We published a three volume set over a thousand pages long collecting all the work he did from Playboy from 1956 to present. Uh, collections of work by artists like Jules Pfeiffer, David Levine. Uh, this is a recent collection publishing all of the great English cartoonist Ronald Searle's work from uh, the work he did in America from 1956 to 1965. He was uh, over here on assignment for magazines throughout that period, working for magazines like Pageant and Esquire, and basically observing America during that period. And this collects all the work he did during that period. And you know, resurrecting work that many people either don't know of or have completely forgotten, like uh, Charles Rodriguez's work from the National Lampoon which is some of the most savage work. I mean, it's, 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 it's every bit as harsh as um, S. Clay Wilson or underground work is being published in The New Yorker at the time and, um, you know, continuing to publish Gay on Wilson. Humbug was a magazine, um, a, pioneering, a pioneering magazine in the 1950s. I started in 1956. It was a consortium of artists. It was the first magazine that was started and owned by a group of artists. Um, it was Harvey Kurtzman, Al Jaffe, Arnold Roth, Jack Davis, and Will Elder. They had just gotten out of Mad Magazine. They had just gotten out of Trump, which was an ill-fated um, work that uh, Harvey Kurtzman did for Hugh Hefner. And they decided to start their own satirical magazine. It ran for two years, uh, and of course it bombed. Um, they, they lost all of their money, um, but they did some of the best work of their lives in this magazine. 
And then the previously mentioned Wits End, we decided that this was another magazine, another creator-owned and creator-operated magazine um, that ought to be collected. And coming up next month is a huge collection of cartoons from Paul Krasner's legendary Realist magazine with a, with a new cover by Jay Lynch. Um, we made a big effort to um, collect you know, what I consider to be one of the most important movements in the history of comics, the underground comics. So we started publishing work like Robert Crumbs, Spain Rodriguez, Jack Jackson, Robert Williams, Victor Moscoso. Basically, we, try, we, we tried to pick what we consider to be the most important underground cartoonists and to create collections by them. Von Baudet, Rory Hayes, Kim Dyche, Jess Clay Wilson, Frank Stack. And uh, last year, we published the complete Zab Comics, which was every single issue of Zab published from 1967 in a five-volume slipcase edition, which we had to follow up uh, by with the complete women's comics. And in addition to publishing comics, because we, were, we, we published a critical magazine, we were interested in you know, criticism and biographical information, essays about comics, we published, um, we published textbooks about comics, such as um, uh, biographies of Milton Kniff, Harvey Kurtzman, and Bernard Kriegstein, The Letters of R. Crumb, <laughs> Rebel Visions, which was a history of underground comics, Cartoons for Victory, which was a history of um, um, home front cartoons during World War II, and um, Wallace, the uh, Life and Legend of Wally Wood is a collection of essays and reminiscences and interviews with Wally Wood. And then one thing we did um, uh, ongoing from the 1980s is to publish translations from the best comics throughout the world. So we published, um, this is by Manuel Fior, we're publishing the complete Craypax by, uh, it's, it's Guido Craypax's entire oeuvre the Italian cartoonist. We publish um, Japanese uh, manga. This is Moto Hagio's work. And the Eternaut is a work started, uh, done in 1956, which is a legendary, legendary work done in Argentina, which went on to become a uh, kind of cultural, uh, cultural touchstone because it was a metaphor for the political turmoil. It's a science fiction story, but turned into a metaphor for the political turmoil that was occurring in Argentina then and during the 1970s. Uh, and then I just wanted to give you a brief rundown of the cartoonists that we're publishing whoops, today. Um, you know, one of the most exciting things about continuing to publish work is to, is to discover new cartoonists. Uh, this is a work by Emil Ferris, who's com it's coming out next month. Well, my favorite thing is Monsters. It's actually a 650-page graphic novel. It's being split into two. Uh, first volume comes out next month. The next volume will come out the following month. Uh, this is a uh, work by Simon Hanselman, uh, Australian cartoonist, now living in the States. Published work is varied. It's uh, Weathercraft by Jim Woodring and um, a brand new graphic novel by R.O. Blackman, who's been working since about 1945. Um, Joe Sacco's Palestine, which we've kept in print since about 1995. And uh, Invisible Ink, Bill Griffith's autobiographical memoir. Uh, Laid Waste, a uh, graphic novel by Julia Grafor, and um, Squirrel Mother, a collection of short stories by Megan Kelso. Temperance, a graphic novel by Kathy Malkasian. Soldier's Heart, which is Carol Tyler's latest long autobiographical memoir. Uh, 
And coming full circle, um, the Comics Journal, because of the uh, death of the print medium, um, we turned the Comics Journal into a kind of biannual 650-page magazine. And this is the latest volume of that where I got, um, I had the privilege of interviewing Maurice Sendak. Um, the next volume will be coming out next year, which I hope will feature a long interview with um, Tommy Unger. And then I wanted to mention um, at the end, when I, when I referred to we and us, um, I wanted to mention my partner, Kim Thompson, who died in 2013. Kim came on board uh, a couple of years after I co-founded the Comics Journal. And so he was my partner for like 35 or 36 years. And an important part of the company, he worked on the Comics Journal initially, um, he edited his own magazines, he introduced um, translated books to the company in the 1980s, uh, continued translating books. He knew um, several languages, so he could do all the translation. He chose them. He grew up in Europe. Um, you know, he edited a lot of his books. Um, and between the two of us, um, you know, Fanographics was a much more, a much stronger company editorially than it would have been with, with either one of us. And then because we started off as such a, um, with, you know, an advocacy magazine, a contentious magazine, um, this is the kind of thing I, you know, and now that we have become um, somewhat grudgingly, you know, an establishment publisher, this is the kind of thing I stay up late and worry about. <laughs> so thank you very much. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. We have time for a couple of questions. Are there a couple of questions? Thank you. This is fascinating. Uh, what was it? There's a question. Well, I was looking forward to, I've seen reference to a New Yorker issue of uh, Public Struggle with an interview with Tess Is that still? When do you, uh, probably not. I mean, I don't remember that. It was advertised in one of the... <laughs> Right, right, right. One of the, you know, you know, we're we're um, we're big dreamers of Fanographics, and it was probably one of the many projects that we, we had in, in mind that probably just didn't come to fruition. Um, although it's you know it's possible we can do that in the future, though. Question over here. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, most of our, I mean, I don't know, I mean, any good cartoonist is probably going to embody, a, you know, a fundamentally um, adroit approach in terms of the nuts and bolts. I mean, you know, all the cartoonists here I would probably recommend, I mean, Charles Burns, uh, Jim Woodring, um, Joe Sacco, um, I mean Roger Langridge. I mean, uh, you know, I mean all the all these cartoonists. Uh, they have to be handy. Um, <laughs> you know, would would be you know, I mean, know the craft so well. Uh, and I think I think most artists. I mean, publish Hal Foster, for example. I mean, you know, for nuts and bolts. I mean, you probably can't get any better than him. But there's so many, so many superlative artists. And I think probably virtually every great cartoonist uh, knows those nuts and bolts and learns that, um, and that's one of the reasons that he or she can become a great cartoonist. So, I mean, I know that's a, a vague and probably useless answer. But. <laughs> um, do you see on the horizon any sort of like relationship between like the Trend, another revolution in comics that would be I you know I don't know I, I you know I think about that because because you know if there is one I'd like to you know <laughs> be part of it um, I mean right now I just I see you know I mean there you know there's there's just new generations that keep coming up faster than I can keep track of them 
And um, I mean, I remember, you know, Gilbert and Jaime and Dan, I mean, they, we were all in our 20s. So we were the new generation. And, um, and so, but, but that really represented a shift. And I don't see that kind of seismic shift happening. I mean, you see over the last 10 years where small press conventions have, you know, have, have um, come up and they're flourishing, you know, conventions like SPX. And, and you know, they're filled with artists. Um, you know, and some are good and a lot are, are not good. And, you know, some of them are going to last and some of them are just, you know, going to fade away. Um, but I, I, I mostly see this just continuing. And I just see, you know, so, you know, there's a powerhouse artist just suddenly, you know, emerging and, you know, and it's, a, it's a continual effort to separate the wheat from the chaff, you know, trying to find, the, you know, the best people doing the work. And so I don't see any kind of seismic shift like that happening. I mean, I can't, I can't, under, I can't foresee what that would be. We've reached some sort of critical mass, I think, in terms of the actual quality of the work. Um, so I just see more good work coming up being inspired by all of the work that has gone gone in the past. And I think we're in this kind of renaissance of cartooning where, you know, I mean, we have several generations of great cartoonists working, I mean, you know, um, w with new cartoonists coming up. So we probably have like, we probably have in terms of sheer mass, the most number of great cartoonists working today than, than ever. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us <coughs> briefly about the sidelining erotic comics that are yeah, I actually, I, I originally had a chapter, but I feared it was a little too long. Um, <clears throat> so I did have uh, like four or five slides about the, um, our, our erotic comics. In 19, let me see, when was it? In 1990, we hit one of our periodic financial cr crunches. I think I mentioned that before. Um, you know, we, were, we, were, we have always been precarious because we did not have $14 million. And... Um, so we would we would occasionally, and you know, we were always flying by the seat of our pants. We, I mean, we never had outside investors. We, you know, we 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 had no, we have no government subsidy. We were always on our own, and so what we had to do um, was just generate enough money to keep us going at all times. And uh, you know, we would do that sometimes by um, publishing some comics we didn't like. There was there was a period in the 1980s where we bought some comics from Charlton Publishing. Charlton Comics was a second-rate publisher that was um, around the 1950s and 60s and 70s. They went out of business. We bought some second-rate comics from them and published them, and they did so well that they just kept us going for a few years. Um, in the 19, 1991, we hit one of our periodic financial crunches. We were slowly growing, going broke. I mean, I could see every month we were losing ground, and I didn't know what to do. And so I came up with the idea that sex sells. You know, <laughs> light bulb went off. And so I said, well, maybe we should publish some sex comics. Um, Howard Jenkins' Black Kiss had come out a year or two earlier than that. And it was and sold very well. And so I noticed that. And so Kim and I sat down and discussed it, and I proposed it, and we just struggled with it. Like, well, you know, should we do this? I mean, is it going to, um, you know, is it, is it, is it, does it compromise us unduly? You know, how do we feel about it? So we kind of, we, we, were, we were agonizing over it. And I remember Robert Crumb was visiting Seattle for some reason, and he was over at the office. And I was talking to him about it, and I said, oh, you know, we don't know whether we should do this or not. You know, we're not sure if we can survive. We're talking about doing, you know, um, porn. And he just looked at me, and he said, do it. What are you talking about? Why are you even, like, you know, why are you even thinking about this? Just go ahead and do it. And so, um, so we did. We started publishing a line called Eros Comics. We sent out word among the professional community that we're looking for comics, you know, about sex. And we started publishing three comics the first month. And uh, then we accelerated, and we were just we were just cranking out smut. I mean, it was unbelievable. <laughs> and within three years, within nine months, we had actually gotten back to square one. We had, we had actually become solvent by nine months of publishing Iros Comics, and uh, we publish we continue publishing. I mean, we we occasionally publish uh, an Eros graphic novel um, even now, but um, we published it for about ten years before it kind of faded. The internet came in, sales started to drop. Um, we published some great stuff. We actually published good work uh, in addition to just 
just you know raw smut. Uh, we published a, a book by Frank Thorne, for example, um, who was a, a journeyman cartoonist who probably did the best work of his career um, doing work for Eros Comics. Uh, Francisco Solano Lopez, who did The Eternaut, um, the, did a, an Eros comic for us. So we actually did try to publish as much good work in the Eros line as possible, but you know, um, uh, but it did. It, it saved us for about a decade. That was, the, that, was the most, that was the most dismal part for me. I think it's necessary. Yeah. You know, periodic financial crises, number, whatever. What was the most, looking back, what was the most uh, satisfying or enjoyable part of that journey from a business point of view? Um, from a business point of view? No, from Just surviving was the most. Yeah. Important. Yeah. Well, you know, we, 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 we always saw. I mean, and I think Kim shared this idea with me. We, we weren't really good businessmen. We weren't born businessmen. We didn't really love being, you know, businessmen. It was a means to an end. You started this when you were twelve. Okay. Yeah, but it's yeah, but it's 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 because all the all you know every other alternative was was worse. Um, and it was a way of, of taking control of your life. It was a way of, of, of taking control of your destiny. I didn't want to be. I wanted to take responsibility for what I did. And back then, back in the 70s, um, my options were I could work for somebody um, or I could try to do this. And the prospect of working for somebody, which I was never very good at, you know, I mean, I worked a lot of jobs and I would either quit or get laid off or get fired because I had a bad attitude. I mean, I just wasn't a good employee. I'd be a terrible employee at Fantagraphics. But, um, so, you know, so I, I wanted to I wanted to do something that I could take pride in and take responsibility for, and that just seemed unlikely if you were a cog in a machine working for some corporation or some company. And the idea of working for, a, I don't know, a small independent company just seemed virtually impossible, so remote. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, you know, just you know, just getting through it, it was you know, um, a, a, a huge feat because we were not, we didn't have a five-year plan, we didn't have a 10-year plan, we were just, we were always, I mean, we sort of do now, but we, you know, we were just struggling to survive um, the whole time, and most of our energies were devoted to the work, you know, to getting the work out. I mean, we didn't even, we didn't even truly market our books until, you know, really the 90s. I mean, our, all of our efforts to market our books, in the, you know, up until then were, pretty half-assed because we really just didn't quite know what we were doing. I think we have to have one last question. Trina? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh, you may not remember this. Uh, it was a comic zine called Mean Streets. Mm -hmm. We had a whole issue about Eros and asked me to contribute and I totally trashed Eros. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> Didn't I write? You were absolutely furious at me. Yes, you did. <laughs> you were so mad. <laughs> Just bringing it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do. I, I, I don't remember the content, but I do remember writing a long letter. <laughs> because, you know, we, we did try. We published uh, women cartoonists. We published gay you know, gay porn. Um, so we tried to publish as wide an array of X-rated material as we could. Um, yeah, we published Gilbert. Um, Terry Laban did one of the best things he ever did for, uh, for us. Um, so yeah, I remember that, Trina. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Spill over into your Tommy Unger because it seems like he, his career had very oh. similar. Uh, well, yeah, Tommy Unger was. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Tommy Unger is a brilliant, brilliant cartoonist. Um, he was a, he was a very successful children's um, artist here in the states in the fifties and sixties, and his career was derailed um, primarily, I think, because of his uh, really brutal anti-war cartoons, his political cartoons, as well as his sex cartoons. He would he would draw these really wild, 
um, I mean, highly imaginative, inventive sex cartoons. And I think um, it was either the combination of the two or primarily his political cartoons that derailed his career as a, um, as a children's book artist. So if I get the opportunity to interview him later this year, we will certainly talk about sex cartoons. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.